September is the most birthday-packed month of the year, so chances are you have a few celebrations coming up. Make sure your friends and family feel special with a gorgeous bouquet of roses from 1-800-Flowers.com. 1-800-Flowers makes it easy to send the perfect gift. 24 multicolored roses for just $39.99. To get 24 multicolored roses for just $39.99, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. Hello, and welcome to the inaugural edition of For All You Kids Out There, a baseball podcast from the Baseball Prospectus Mets team. I'm your host, Jeffrey Paternostro. You may remember me from such shows as Amazing Avenue Audio, and that one time I was on MLB Now because someone got sick at the last second. I'm also a senior prospect writer at Baseball Prospectus and a contributor at BP Mets. Joining me in the co-host seat is Jarrett Seidler, a member of the BP Prospect team and a weekly columnist at BP Mets. Jarrett, we're doing a podcast. We are doing a podcast. We've actually been doing a podcast for the last couple of months, but it's about the West Wing and not baseball. So. We're doing a podcast that will hopefully be listened to by slightly more people. Yes. So if you found this, you probably have some idea of how this is going to go because you perhaps listened to one or more podcasts featuring Jarrett and I in the past. But I still think we should start off with a, a statement of purpose. I'm trying to sort of relearn how to ride a bike here. I managed to get through that intro, which is a very different intro from what I've been (laughs) doing for the last three years, with minimal tap dancing. So basically, yeah, go ahead. You you came up up with the you came up with the good joke, so I'll let you I'll let you tell it. Our purpose here is that we want to be up and in, so we want to get hired as a scouting director and a senior scout in about five years. Yeah, yeah. So So. we're gonna gonna have a very very long podcast nominally about the Mets mostly about baseball and you know we're gonna drink and chat and we have a guest we have David Roth from Vice Sports on this week pretty good get for our first episode I have a little bit of pull left we we may sneak some professional wrestling in occasionally but we'll yeah, we'll I'm, sneak I'm that sure. towards the end as you do
Salutations, Mets fans, and welcome to the 300th edition of For All You Kids Out There, a Mets Adjacent to Baseball Perspectives podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Paternostro, and with me once again this week is Jarrett Seidler. Jarrett, it's our 300th episode. That's too many episodes. Uh, God knows I have more than 300 Mets podcasts under my belt at this point. But oh. we decided that there's no like fancy, we've done the live shows. In a, in Every live show we do, which was which for a while was a running joke, it's just been a disaster in terms of I, audio. I mean, yes, they've been fun to do, but yes, they have not been the right. best. They have not given the son, sonorous tones of myself and Jarrett and whoever else that you've, you've come to expect over the last six years of the show, five years of the show, whatever. You had the, you had the idea to drive down here, to which my response was, "What? I mean, that's actually going to be technically." Yeah, I don't know what the point of that would be. Yeah, like, the audio would have been difficult to do, and also that would not have had any particular benefit to the audience or whatever. But... It would have sounded exactly the same. (laughs) Yes. We... With worse audio. Decided that, you know, we had a little crisis a few weeks ago. I think we both sort of agree that things that keeps us going, both in this podcast and, and... the Mets social media community space at large is the community and the people we've met through the show and our friends, supporters, and well-wishers. So we're going to do a show with all of them. It's going to be pretty much a traditionally structured show in so much as this show has any traditional structure. This is the first half of the show. I will actually introduce it, so we're already off to an unusual start. We're going to talk about the Mets and the week of Mets baseball. With our good friend from Mason Avenue, Allison McKaig. Allison, how's it going? How's your knee? <laughs> it's fine. It's better. You know, it has a you big You crashed and burned worse than the Mets on the West Coast. I, I did. I did. With 800 meters left in the race, no less. 10-mile race, 800 meters left. Just completely ate it on the pavement. A normal, a normal Sunday for both me and the New York Mets. Uh, it's been a week. The Mets lost two out of three in Miami in horrible fashion as they are wont to do. As we enter play on Sunday night, we're recording this before the Sunday night baseball game. They are five and a so half if back. So if, if the Mets have some yeah, wonderful do you, like, people way... Know, on people the, know, people yes, know the disclaimer it, at this point. We are not recording a fucking podcast at midnight. Like, I mean, if something really doing. weird happens, maybe we will. I, if they blow another nine-run lead or something. Between my regular job and yeah. BP, I have worked something like 105 hours in the past seven days. So I am know, not it, doing it. We know podcast. Philly's prospect content this week. That'll be on the Twitch stream tomorrow. So if yeah. you're looking and for I, Philly's prospect and I, content. And I, and I have to write three 10-pack alerts after. You do. Uh, you volunteered to do that. Yeah. I've got a bunch in the backlog, but you volunteered to do that. Uh, I did, to that point, I did consider making this episode 300 minutes, which we're capable of doing, but... I have a 14 Not month old week. and Jarrett just yeah. hung, what is it, 40, you say 48? 48 feet string of string lights. lights. Yeah. Yes. I went to, I went out from the, uh, from like the ledge of the roof, like out to the gazebo, went around the gazebo and back to like the other side. And hung you got some good bit. Edison bulbs, a little recessed right. lighting. Well, I got the, the, Costco got a 48-foot, like, mm-hmm. LED, like, kind of old-fashioned looking bulb yep. unit for $5. It's, uh, well, speaking... I, then proceed to, <laughs> I then proceed to use about 40 command strips to keep yeah. them up. Speaking they'd of 48. Out, yes. Jacob deGrom. Jacob deGrom. Jacob deGrom. Uh, we got some news about Jacob deGrom. It is appropriate that we start the 300th episode with Jacob deGrom's, with the Jacob deGrom arm concern. I guess Fuck. maybe yeah, not. Depends on who you talk to. Uh, Sandy Alderson came out earlier this week and gave a quote uh, with regards to Jacob DeGrom's rehab that after spending two months saying there was no structural damage, oh, no, no, no. He had a UCL sprain, but it's healed now. Yeah. I am not a doctor. Jared <laughs> is not a doctor. Allison is a doctor, but not this kind of doctor. Right. But closer to this kind of doctor than either me or Jeffrey. Uh, like, listen. Done some I light have, Tommy John surgery in your days, in Allison. <laughs> I have background in biology. I'm not a medical doctor, but I am pretty sure that 
a bruise is not a, a ligament tear. I'm pretty sure those are not equivalent. <laughs> hmm. uh, Jacob deGrom, then after saying he absolutely was not going to talk to the media about this, did give a statement that literally ran away from. The well, he did that before the this. I think that was the day before the Alderson quote. The day yeah, after the Alderson quote, still. he said, absolutely not going to take questions on this. However, I heard what Alderson said, and that's just not right. My arm is fine. Oh, man. Uh, much like this podcast, the Mets are just playing the hits. Yeah, they sure are. And then today, I, mean, I think Decomo tweeted that, or here Decomo, or one of the beats, I think it was Decomo. I think they all had it, tweeted that. He's going to throw off a mound this week, and they're going to try to get him one or two outings before the end of the season. The Mets! Yeah. The Mets! I mean, so... There's a lot to unpack here. Like, mm. a lot. A lot. Um, one is that... There's no nice or kind way to say this, but you can never believe anything the Mets say about injuries. They, I mean, they no, I mean, that's the, not. Yeah. They lie on the record. They lie off the record. They refuse to confirm things. The yeah. They obfuscate off the record. Um, they are not a reliable source for injuries for their own players, which yeah. is bad. There's, Carlos there's Carrasco no has never had a setback in his life. Right, um, and that is something that I think it was reasonable to think changed yeah. or was going to change. Well, you say it that, but it's, it's the same front office head. Yeah, and it did not at all. They still are not a reliable source on injuries, and most teams are. This is unusual. Right. This is actually unusual. Teams might end up being wrong on their own evaluations of the players' injuries, but... Right. Yeah. Um, and usually teams are the thing teams will lie about is they'll lie about timelines they'll tell you a couple of weeks longer so you don't end up in the Mike Trout situation. Mike right. Trout has obviously had a number of setbacks with his calf um, and they've become visible because they gave an 8 to 10 week timeline probably expecting him to be back in 6 to 8 right. but he's actually been out 16 at this point. Yep. So, um the Mets said there was no structural damage for three months and then said there was structural damage, but not really. DeGrom is disputing that. Schrodinger's several of the things, well, right, several of the things that happened don't make sense. I don't know why Alderson would have said that if it wasn't true. It was too specific. Right. I, I mean, yeah. there, like, UCL tears can heal on their own. Usually, it's not a two-month window. Sprain, okay, partial sprain. tear. Sprain yeah. is sprain is a tear, <laughs> right? The, the, sure, this yeah. is a sliding scale, right? Um, they did. So the other, if you really want to dig into the weeds here, I guess that's what we're gonna do on our three hundredth episode. Weird Mets criminology. It's back. Yeah, the Mets never. never the Mets always said repeatedly, and I think we noted it. On the podcast, there was never any unexpected damage on the MRI. So it's possible he's been pitching with a partial tear in his UCL for a much longer period of time, one could suppose. He has had a lot of precursor slash um, potential side injuries that would have indicated UCL damage over the last few years. Right. We've Is that a good way to put it? The yearly yeah. Jacob deGrom flexor, arm scare. Yeah. Forearm. He's had forearm issues. He's had flexor issues. The type of stuff you would associate with a damaged UCL. Now, hmm. this year he's obviously repeatedly had forearm tightness. He's repeatedly... Well, this thing, too, is it puts everything problems. they've said about him going back to he just keeps injuring himself on swings into stark relief. You can't trust them on any of that. Yeah. And DeGrom himself does not seem pleased by any of this. And, like, part of that might just be he wants to be out there pitching and he can't for whatever reason. Yeah. And he's not the most forthcoming with the press in general. 
he clearly he's clearly mad about something yes. we're not sure which part of it he's mad about he clearly didn't want this out there mm. now why he didn't want it out there is not as clear i don't know whether it was because it's not true. I don't know whether it's because he didn't want it out there for privacy reasons or for personal, you know, accomplishment reasons, or he didn't want it to be an excuse, but he clearly didn't want this out there. Mm -hmm. That was, I mean, and there's no reason you don't have to like, if he's not back this year, it's not necessarily indicative of anything. Like he shouldn't be back this year, even if he didn't have a UCL tear probably because whatever else is going on. I would recommend actually watching the clip of his media availability instead of just sure. reading the quotes because he was very clearly angry and upset. Right. We've seen this before. And like It was basically when he was trying to force him into offering him an extension. Yes. He, th- this was not... Like, he's not... Like we said, he doesn't like talking to the media, but he's usually perfect. Like he just does his media hit and he's perfectly whatever during it for the yes, most part. Yes, he has been... He has been not talking to the media specifically and then sought them out to say one thing and then wouldn't talk anymore and was clearly pretty upset. And the thing he was disputing was something his own team president said. Now, Allison, uh, I'll I'll tee this one up for you. If Sandy Alderson is bad at hiring can't stop his organization from having sex pests infested at all levels and is dealing poorly with the media and players, what is the argument for him having a job with the New York Mets? There is none. I, he should not, he should not be involved with the organization in any capacity moving forward. I'm sure that they will at the very least keep him as like special assistant to whomever, but they shouldn't. He should just be gone. I yet. over the last, certainly the last year, but even going back to the last few years with the Mets, I had a lot of respect for Sandy Alderson, uh, what he had accomplished over the course of his career, things that he had done behind the scenes, stories I'd heard about um, that weren't public, um, and I would say. What year was the VP Mets day when he just acted? When 20, he told twenty nineteen. It was after. It was one after he got fired because he came. I remember. I, I remember. I was really impressed. He came and did it anyway. Yeah. So it would have been. It would have been 20, 20, uh, 18, 2018, 2018. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say twenty eighteen is the year. Around no, twenty eighteen. No, yeah, because twenty nineteen was the Brody one. Yeah, that oh, yeah, was yeah. the Brody one. Right. Around twenty eighteen, you started seeing some cracks in this. Um, he was going through certain, significant health issues at the time, too. But, you know, certain things that weren't handled so well yeah. and situations in which he seemed callous to personnel or callous to, um, you know, we've told in broad strokes this story around here how he was, like, you know, trying to, like, expose, like, younger minor leaguers to, like, hot older women. <laughs> like, and, like, thought that was, like, a big competitive advantage. Like, that sucks. That like really sucks, and I I just I I don't know whether the game has passed him by. I don't know whether he has turned rea- more reactionary in some ways. I don't know whether six or seven years with the <laughs> Mets ingrained all of these bad Jeff Wilpon ticks in his head. But the idea that he was the guy to build the architecture of Dodgers East. Listen, I am, from an ethical standpoint, no fan of Andrew Friedman. I've talked about it a great length on Twitter. I've talked about it a great length on here. Have written about it, although not great length. But Andrew Friedman is really good at this shit. And Sandy Alderson can't get his story straight about what's wrong with Jacob DeCrum's elbow. Can you ima- Could you imagine Andrew Friedman going out and giving that presser? Ever, yeah, yeah. no, well, he's given a lot of bad pressures on other stuff, but I was yeah. not, a, say, not on this one. Given bad, he's given bad quotes on Trevor Bauer, yes, That's but those lot. are, yeah, but those are 
He wasn't confused. He just wanted <laughs> Trevor Bat. He wanted the last year's NL Cy Young winner pitching for his baseball team. Right. Yes. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. Sandy Alderson came across like Abe Simpson in that press conference. Yeah, it's. And I mean, it's like, it's been I, a I year, also... I guess. I also was not I was not against the Mets bringing back Sandy Alderson as like a transitional, you know, guy through both, the next. It both, yeah. It both made and didn't make sense in a way. Cuz he yeah. was always going to be mean, an impediment knew... to as we've seen to hire uh, like we're hearing Michael Hill's name again. I'm sure that Michael Hill is putting his name out there again, but they're, it's yeah. the same people. We're getting, lots of lots of Bobby Heck talk again. Yeah. We're getting the same people and part of that might be because there's nobody like they're the same group of people that talk to the same group of media members and or want extensions or raises or title bumps like Eric Neander just got one based on the let's, I mean let's, Eric Neander's done a great job there but based on the let's, idea let's, that the hit, let's hire him again. pause let's okay. hit pause for a second here let's say hypothetically Sandy Alderson's plan actually was to hire an Eric Neander David Stearns Mike Chernoff type mm-hmm to actually run baseball and just kind of really big picture 28,000 feet oversee it. Yeah. I actually think that would have been okay. Right. But they, I'm going to say it. They went, they had five, six people they approached and were either denied by the teams or denied by this or denied by that. It was a pan- like the, char- it was the middle of the pandemic. Quarter. Yeah. Who did you hear their primary target was? It's been long enough that I think we can talk about this, right? Now I'm trying to remember because it's been a fucking year. Um, I thought their primary target was Neander. Like, even going yeah, back to last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, I heard from multiple people last fall, early last winter, that the Mets' dream was to pull Eric Neander from the race. Right. And... You know, they couldn't, wouldn't, didn't. I don't know if there's a huge difference there. Yeah. They, you can, you can always make, if you're willing to throw enough money to buy the guy out of his contract and throw enough money at the guy, you can always. Go send them another Neurozo Catalina. (laughs) Right. Like you can always make this go. Mm -hmm. And maybe. You can't do that for everybody, but the idea you would whiff on Eric Neander. This is David the Rays. Stern, the Rays Michael are absolutely Turnoff, going to Dark Fall r- rake v. you over the coals, but they're gonna. Right. They they view Neander as probably as expendable as Blake Snell when it comes down right. to it. David Force, like you weren't able to get any of these people to come there. My initial reaction to that is, you probably didn't throw enough money at this problem. And I think that might have been borne out in some of their free agent decisions as well. Right. And we're not talking about huge amounts of money. No, that's here. the thing. Like, I was talking. Uh, the highest paid baseball executives in baseball are in, like, the $10 million range. We're not talking. Yeah. That's the thing, million. right? So I was not talking uh, to Craig on Five and Dive this week, and we're talking about, like, the Yankees' managerial situation and what they might do if they want to move on from Aaron Boone or whatever. And Craig's like, well, they should just go get Craig Council. And I'm like, well, why would Craig Council leave Milwaukee? And Craig's like, well, they can just pay him more. And like, yes, they can pay him more, but short of blowing up the executive pay structure, and this applies to managers as well, it's not like you can, it's not like with like, I'm going to get a good example of this. It's not like Robinson Cano, where the Mariners outbid everyone by $80 million. Yes. Like you can't do that with it. Like you're just not going to blow up the executive or managerial pay structure. You're just not going to be able to pay Craig Council significantly more money than the Brewers can. But why not? I mean, that's so that's the argument, right? We said this on the show before too. You could just pay, like, you could pay every analytics. They so just go hire a bunch of analytics people for one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. Literally, what like, the Dodgers did. Right, like analyst level job, like. But there's it, this is a collusive cartel, and they're going to hate that almost more than overpaying the players. But that's also one of the things the Rays do. The Rays pay 
the Rays pay staff, well, and they take care of their staff well. Right. They have a lot of them, yes. Right, the Ra- until, the they no method, have, yeah. until they no longer have a need for you, but mm-hmm. they consider the value gain from yeah, having the, the a... Rays method is not actually just not being able to spend enough money. They have to, quote-unquote, do the right thing, as one Mets vlog writer suggested this week. It's actually that they <laughs> spend a shit ton in pro scouting and analytics, and they're very good at both. Yes, because the total expense of spending yes. a shit ton instead It's less of than Blake Snell's uh, next year of his pre arbitration It's extension. less than Blake Snell's next two weeks of paycheck. <laughs> right? Like, mm-hmm. it's just not... the Between having a top-level pro scouting department and having no pro scouting department at all, two, 2.5 million a year, yeah, probably. Like probably, yeah. Yeah, a little bit more in terms of travel expense and stuff sure, like that, sure. but... Pro scouts don't make that much money. They like, don't. You know, a good salary for a pro scout, like you know, sixty thousand dollars, yeah, eighty. Yeah, like you know, if you if you if you're throwing a hundred thousand dollars at a scout, you're going to get almost anybody you want in the industry. Until you start getting up to like the assistant director level, but just right. like a regular level pro scout, like it's not. This is not difficult. You know, you can. You can assemble a really great a lot of these analytics people, you can get the you know hundred and fifty K is gonna get you some really good analytics people. Right, and that's what they the funny thing is what they make in like a, if you have a PhD in statistics, like actuarial level math skills, you can make that starting out in corporate America. Of course you can. Yep. <laughs> but people will work for less to work for baseball sure. teams. You just have to pay them more than the other teams are going Which to. Which is not hard to do. Yeah. It really is. And it it's really, I mean, it depends who you are, though, about like whether you'll work for less to work for baseball teams. Like, I got sent the, I mean, frankly, I got sent the Mets job, like one of the Mets analyst jobs, by like four different people in my Hopkins circle because they, like, you know, th- these PhD level people who can code get get these like list serves. And they get these jobs sent to them, and everyone's like, oh, Allison's the baseball person who would care about this. None of the rest of my friends would care about that job at all. They can make way more just by going to pharmaceuticals. Out of curiosity, how much were they paying for that job? I think it was... Oh, God. I didn't even look at the salary because I looked at the qualifications, and I was like, bless you guys, I am not qualified for this. Thank you, though. Um... Oh, I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look through my texts, but I, well, I I don't want to say because I don't remember for sure. I mean, I have a friend who's a very, very, very good coder who's a baseball fan and who thought about working in baseball um, a few years ago, not super recently. Um, and he just like he started asking around, and he has some friends that work in the industry, including me. And ultimately, my response to him was like. You know, you can probably get like, you know, 50, 55, 60 K. What are you being offered from private firms in your <laughs> field? And he's like 125, 130, 140. Okay. What are you going to be making after a couple of years? 200, 220. Um, you realize you're going to work awful hours. They're going to treat you like shit. You're probably going to get fired at some point relatively quickly. Like, just go make a bunch of money and you'll have enough money where if you want to buy really good tickets to a baseball game, you can buy really good tickets to a baseball game. And he went is working privately, makes an absolute shit ton of money and you know, is still a baseball fan. That's it. It's, but there's enough people that aren't like right. that. It's the people that just want to work in the industry. We all know them. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of them in the uh, scouting or wannabe scouting community. Just as um, many analysts, too. Yeah, probably even more because mm-hmm. there's fewer people with the skills to do scouting type stuff. Um, uh, is that a hot a take? <laughs> then to code. Yeah, it, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, there's a gazillion people that, but a lot more people that know how to code than know like hitting mechanics, like sure. a pro scout or an yes. amateur scout level. Um, there's also a lot more analytics people working for major league baseball teams now than there are scouts. So. <laughs> also true. Well, like my friend Rob, who you yeah, met, is a I mean, software engineer, and I don't even bother to send him the baseball yeah. software engineering jobs anymore. 
Right. It's just I like, no... thought worth it. Right. So, you know, I just people... went back to my emails and found it, but it's obviously the like actual job post is not up anymore. So like all I have is the like job description summary and like duties and qualifications because the the salary was not in the right. Initial. It's like you know, master's degree required, <laughs> PhD preferred, two to five years of experience. We'll pay you twenty percent of what the going rate for all of this in your field is. That's baseball. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, strong a, proficiency R Python similar. Strong proficiency SQL. Yep. Like. Yeah. Do, do you know what people who have that level of proficiency in those actually get paid? Like for real. It's a lot. A, right. And but there's nothing saying the Mets can't just pay market rate and end up having like a really good staff of all. Right, people like to live in New York too, so. Sure. You might have to pay a little more because it costs a living, but yeah, other than that. And again, this is literally what the Dodgers did. Yes. Also a nice place to live. Right. They just started throwing money at this problem. It's like 17 assistant GMs or whatever it is. Right. Within two years, they assembled a killer staff of all of these people. And they've got people that have, you know, very specified strengths within their department, you know. And the Mets aren't the Mets. I mean, again, we've heard really good things about Ben Zosmer. He was like yeah, but the seventh in command guy. of the Dodgers. I know, but he's also like the right. seventh in command of the Dodgers. Like, right? But yeah, the, you can't build. No, you can't. This you is their. You're hearing good things about more than one guy. You're hearing <laughs> yes. good things about ten guys, and they also need to not all be guys, and they also need to not all be white guys. And the Dodgers have done better than at that than most teams too. Uh, the Mets haven't. No, they haven't. Uh, and they're not just for the obvious reasons of it's the right thing to do, but you need diverse viewpoints and backgrounds within your front office to actually get all of the best ideas there. Yeah, and also perhaps like to that... avoid hiring a series of sex pests. Yeah. Again, yeah. I don't want to put that on the non like men to prevent them from hiring those guys but you might have you have a better chance having someone that would like and like interact with them. oh did you ever work with this guy yeah he's a creep oh okay great good to know i have no idea what raquel ferrera would have said about jared porter and zach scott mm-hmm. but the idea that she worked with them and was their superior and sandy alderson never called her about right. them is yeah, yeah. Like, did you not check any of these guys' references? You are hiring for high-level... I have a friend right now who is interviewing for a scouting job with a team who has had his references checked more thoroughly than this. And then, like, like, I don't know, what what finally... What what totally broke me on Sandy Allerson, like, permanently, was... In that, in that piece in The Athletic that came out after the, after the Scott, after the uh, Porter debacle, um, you know, where he basically, where it came out that, you know, they brought back David Newman, even though multiple women spoke to him and said not to, and he did it anyway. And at I the knew end David of that, Newman was a creep. Like, that <laughs> right. was around baseball. That was known. Yeah, like... And, like, he brought him back anyway, and the quote at the end of that article yeah. is, like, what permanently broke me yes. when Sandy Alderson acted like being asked about that that was a waste of his goddamn time. When he was like, oh, is there not a statute of limitations on this stuff? I was like, oh, this guy does not give us. I mean, like, the, that, when you bring him back, I feel like it resets the statute. You can then, again, ask, why did you bring this guy back? That was right. not... If you knew enough to know know who David Newman was, you knew that. Like, that was not a particularly... Granted that most Mets fans have no idea who David Newman is, which is fine. He was a mid-level ticketing and marketing executive. Who cares? But, you know... How did they not blow all these people out? You've got... These are all Jeff Wilpon cronies. Half of them were named either directly or indirectly <laughs> in Lee Kasserine's lawsuit. And, you know, it, it's fucking, you know, you got Sandy Alderson releasing statements about cancel culture to the athletic. Like, well, you can't find any MBAs in New York City, God knows. <laughs> 
The idea that they wouldn't clean this part of the organization up just, like, didn't occur to me. Yeah, a lot yeah. of things I thought might go wrong here. I thought... All of those Cohen, have also gone wrong, by the way. <laughs> all of those have also gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Cohen might be reactionary. That has turned out to be true. Um, I thought he might not spend a lot. So far, that has turned out to be true. Um, I thought he might not really be interested in changing broad stroke cultural issues. That has turned out to be true. The idea that they would keep all of these people that were bad at their jobs and also shitty and just like, I assume they would continue to lie about players injuries or rush them back without rehab assignments or et cetera, et cetera. Or make them play through injuries like Hmm. J.D. Davis is currently doing. The closest thing... The closest thing to the actual derailment the second time of Steve Cohen's bid for the Mets Mm -hmm. was the hostile workplace and harassment lawsuits against Point 72. So I just assumed, given that that almost (laughs) stopped him from getting the team, given that that almost swung the team to A-Rod and J-Law, alternate alternate universe, can you imagine if that had happened and they broke up six months later? Mm. Anyway. um, Ben Affleck, managing partner of the New York Mets. Oh, my God. (laughs) Given given that that had been an issue in his purchasing of the team – the idea that he would just come into the Mets and not even have like any ideas or answers or attempts to not do this, like one or two of these, like you can actually say, maybe there's no problem with the vetting, maybe we just fucked up, maybe Jared Porter was just secretly this awful guy and nobody knew, although there were at least a few people that knew. Sure. But this has happened like five times now in a year for like the most random ass people. Like you're fucking protecting a minor league hitting coordinator who's harassing women. It's the fucking minor league hitting coordinator. Like, I think that was the one where he released the super gross statement to the athletic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The Newman and Ellis stuff, I think, was in the same article. I don't remember exactly offhand. but Yeah, it was. Yeah. And that was the one with the the HR person also. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. The Mets. Uh, like, you know, Go ahead, Joe. I, it's fucking Ryan Ellis. Like, yeah, who no, cares? Like, it... Every time I see a Britt Garoli and Katie Strang byline on The Athletic, like, my initial reaction is, what horrible shit about the Mets is going to be in it this time? No, that's literally me, too. I just always think it's going to be about the Mets. And half of the time it is! It, it is. mostly is. I mean, this is, to be clear, a baseball-wide issue. It's not just the Mets. It's just been a but lot of Mets recently. Mets that, it's it has been Mets a lot more of the Mets, yeah. In Major League Baseball. And that is an organizational and cultural problem. Yeah. That is a problem. Sandy Alderson, to me, does not appear equipped to handle this problem. Well, the good news is they're going to bring in Theo Epstein, so. Totally. Solve all the problems, yeah. Sure, he'll just start handing out shots at Jägermeister and all the interns. I think I have Jägermeister somewhere in the house. I was making a. Precision timepieces, which is a Negroni riff. No, it's not a Negroni. It is a Negroni riff. What is in that? I think it's an Ivy Mix we're, cocktail. We we were discussing before we started recording poor decisions made in college. <laughs> yeah, and um, almost all of mine involved the Agarbois. There's a Corvo Gold, <laughs> which I couldn't drink for ten years afterwards, and still don't like. Uh, yes, that's me with the Agarbois. I just, my worst night that involved Jägermeister was, like, when you take a shot of Jägermeister and then you chase it with Hershey's chocolate syrup. That sounds awful. Awful. That was a college thing that happened. So it is uh, one and a half ounce Jägermeister, three quarter ounce of Montenegro, three quarter ounce Aperol, two dashes of pimento bitters. 
It's quite good. I want. I once lost a bet in college that ended with me having to drink an entire 750 of Jaeger in an hour. And oh, that, oh that, man. The next that's... 36 hours were really rough. Oh, my God. I think I'd die. I went shot for shot with Jose Cuervo Gold at a cast party for my college TV show with a friend of mine. and That did not. Uh, all I remember, I it, was, it was an episode with, the, I remember we were out on the balcony in Merrill. If you, if you know Hampshire College, the Merrill dorms. Um, I don't know why anyone, maybe someone listening to the show does Dorian would. Hi, Dorian. Um, Dorian also probably knows who he's doing shots with. Uh, it was, a, the rock was hosting SNL. I remember that cause I wandered in around 1am and the rock was on TV. Un- unlike now, I, I, I do not drink much anymore and I, I cannot handle I alcohol. I finished all of the 10% Imperial stout I've been drinking so far through the first half of the show. I, I, I do not, you know, if you, if you give me four beers, I will be pretty uh, tipsy now. Um, in college, I could I drank a lot, and I could handle a lot of alcohol, and an entire bottle of Jägermeister was substantially more than I could handle. Yeah, it's a lot, um, it's a lot of alcohol, Jarrett. Yeah, I, I, but, you know, I could, I could drink, like, It's not like it's something a normal person does. Yeah. Well, it's certainly the only time I do that. I've probably said this on the podcast before, but my mixed drink when I was in college was Mountain Dew and Bacardi 151. I think I remember this. Which is just not not quite an Emma Bachelary level concoction, but not that <laughs> far off. We uh, I remember one, so Jan Peach Tournament. Schnapps and Arnold Palmer uh, was my, consumed a lot by me. My, my greatest memory of the Bacardi 151 and Mountain Dew combination was one time I was drinking it. And I used to drink it out of the Mountain Dew bottle. And, like, I accidentally spilled a little bit. And I was standing in a handicapped parking spot. And it took out half of the handicapped paint. <laughs> just like, oh, like, my God. So... <laughs> At, at which point I realized I was basically drinking pain thinner. Yeah. Nobody had class on Fridays. So Thursday nights we do SoCo and Fanta parties. And we would drive up to the New Hampshire State Liquor Store because it was cheaper. Uh, and they had the 100 proof SoCo. So yeah, we did that. That was terrible. Um, I remember one Jan term because uh, Hampshire doesn't really have classes in January, but the dorms are open. So people just go up there and drink. I mean, I just went up there and drank. I don't think I ever took a class in January. I didn't pass many classes there, so neither here nor there. We did a, we did, I found a printout for a raw drinking game, Monday Night Raw. And we did it with a friend of mine, but all I had for booze was like two thirds of a leftover 24 pack of Sam Adams cherry wheat and a handle of Johnny Walker Black. I used to drink a lot of Sam Adams cherry wheat. Yeah, I don't remember how that Sam Adams went, but cherry not great. is good. It's fine. Like I like wheat beers. I like cherry, so whatever. I used to uh a friend of mine and I would like split a case of it for like a Saturday night a decent amount cuz you know that was a thing I did and probably That's what you could get you could get like Sam Adams cherry wheat and you get Magic yeah. Hat number 9. Those were like the two. Yeah. Well, that was that was like that was like the good beer as opposed right. to like just drinking like Keystone Lights or something like that. PBR in Hampshire. Yeah, because Hampshire is Hampshire at all times. At all times, PBR or Red Stripe, yeah. Yeah, but that might was like been too early for Red Stripe. More the yeah, it might have been maybe later at Hampshire. My Hampshire career, Red Stripe was a thing, but I do remember the thirty-six pack of PBR on the back porch in Enfield. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other Mets content? What else has happened this week? I feel like stuff has happened. I mean, they've, I really haven't seen it, if it has. And they have not played well. Uh, Binghamton got shut down because of a coronavirus outbreak. That's the thing that happened. That was last week. Not I mean, this into week. this week. They're, they're back now. They are Ryan back playing. Yes. It was promoted. Uh, um, several players are not playing in Binghamton that were previously playing in Binghamton. You can read into that what you will. I mean, that's remarkably obvious but sure yeah. Brandon and Imo got hurt again but then is progressing faster than expected also very Mets because we Mets. never actually learn anything no we don't uh, Tomas Nito and Jordan Yamamoto are in Syracuse on a rehab assignment there's lots of dudes on rehab assignments like Jake Reed, Reed is also in rehab and I'm like 
There's not Corey enough Oswald. roster Corey space Oswald's for all these guys. Good for Corey Oswald. Corey Oswald's got to be like a seven-year minor league free agent now, right? No, he's on the major league forty. He's on the fifty-six day IL. Forty man. Yeah. Yes. Jesus. Yeah, he got called up and got oh, hurt. He called up and got hurt. Yeah, yeah you're right. So they yeah. Can't, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have a lot of players on the sixty man, so or sixty day. Corey so Oswald's Corey Oswald's, Oswald's going to get to two years of service this year God with all this IL time. It's eligible for the terrible insurance policy that they have for life. Yes. Uh, and the Mets are just kind of all right, moving so along. I will say this. Going into the last series in Atlanta, mm-hmm. will they have a shot at the playoffs? No. I, I also say no. I think they're going to be eliminated like the Wednesday before that. So yeah, yeah, take yeah, it yeah. We, did this, we did this same question on a pod of their own this week, yeah. and I said no. Yeah. So as they're... of the exact second we're recording this they're three and a half out of the second wild card but there's four teams, teams between. Between. they do play the cardinals next which is one of the yeah. teams ahead of them they do play the phillies after and that which is phillies. one of the teams ahead of them so and they are five and a half out of the division yeah i would assume on playoff odds they're more likely to win the division because the number of the number of teams is probably and they have three games with atlanta left too um they are seventy-one and seventy-two. They are. My my guess is that they will probably need to win around eighty-six or eighty-seven to make it. So you're looking at sixteen and five the rest of the way. I think that math yeah. is right. I mean, how many games when the the Padres have a f- brutal schedule the rest of the way? I'm not convinced the Reds are particularly good. And they yeah. like I could see the wild card being eighty five and seventy seven. It's just that that's not. There are there are five teams. No, I know what you're saying. Seventy four and seventy one wins. Somebody is going to get hot there. Like it's just that's how. Yeah, I mean, that would involve the Mets go. going fourteen and five, so they would be the team that got hot under that definition. I somebody's probably going to be hotter than that, especially yeah, the, given that you're spotting most of I these mean, teams. I mean, looking at these teams, though, man, I don't know if that's true. You're spotting most of these teams two, three, four games. No, no I understand. So. I'm not saying it's more than like 10%, but I think they have a better chance of the wild card than the division is what I'm saying. No, I think they have a better chance. Yeah, of the fair enough. Because they really only need the Braves. Are the, Mets, are the Mets going to finish with a better record than the Philadelphia Phillies? Yes, Probably. <laughs> Yeah, the I think yes. The yeah. Phillies are like, yeah, full on. I don't even. We have, oh, I guess, since this is our three hundred episode, we have to do some Phillies content because this is primarily a Phillies prospects podcast. Um, I'm going to throw this out there: the Mets should claim Daniel De Los Santos. Sure, they should not claim Vince Velasquez. It's Somebody's going to claim Vince Velasquez. Up, right? Is Vance Worley still in our system? He is, right? He's in pitching in AAA. Yeah. Speaking of Philadelphia Phillies back end starters, I mean the current the current Syracuse roster is a lot of fun. To be fair, oh they moved a lot of guys around this week. They have a lot of rehab, and they need to fill out the double A roster because of the COVID outbreak. Uh, <laughs> they still have Dylan Batances on a rehab assignment there, which is uh, which is hilarious. Uh, yeah. Some other highlights: uh, Jared Eikhoff. Also, his, I, how many times has he re-upped with the Mets after declaring free agency after being DFA? It's like four times this year now. Yeah. Zach Godley. Uh, Harold Gonzalez on yeah. 60 day. My great regret of this season is Harold Gonzalez did not stay long enough, uh, stay healthy long enough to pitch like 23 innings for the Mets this year, which would have happened. Because he, def- he definitely would have. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, Adam Oler, who like legitimately might be like their fourth best pitching prospect at this point. Wow. Uh, Sean, Reed, Sean Reed Foley on rehab assignment. Rodis Viscaino is there. Oh, he's on the restricted list now. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Vance Worley. Yes, Vance Worley. Um, they have five catchers in AAA right now. <laughs> I'd ask how many of you can name, but it's like almost not fair. I don't even know who one of them is, so... 
Wow. Oh, Chester well, Cuthbert. Chester Cuthbert has been there like all year. Has he been good? All right. Without looking, Jared, what would you guess Chester Cuthbert's triple slash line is in Syracuse? 240, 290, 450. It's very dramatic. 230, 290. Not bad. 215, 325, 404. Okay. So there's more walks and less mm. extra base hits than I thought. Yeah. I thought it was going to be more weighted, but I guess not. Yeah. Who else is even on this? Let's, let's take a little look before we before we sign off to go watch the Mets game. Let's uh, take a look at the Syracuse Mets roster. Just out of my personal uh, curiosity, twenty twenty one Syracuse Mets. Let's see, so the best player they got any. So the best player they got any significant at-bats. We'll say that over 200 at-bats for the Syracuse Mets this year. Who would you say has the highest OPS? I will tell you their OPS is 885. So it's not Chesler Cuthbert. It is not Chesler Cuthbert. No, sorry. That was, that was a possibility given how that was phrased. Um... Did Janesh Ray Fargus play there long enough to be an option here? Uh, I don't even see. Oh, good. Yeah. He only got 37 plate appearances in AAA. Okay. Really. He was hurt and up fairly quickly. And... Um. I have no idea. Albert Almora. Does he have enough plate appearances? No, he definitely uh, 153, doesn't. more than you'd think, but he does not. Uh, Albert Almora hit 268, 327, 435. Yeah. I, I will give you the top five that have more than 200 plate appearances. <laughs> it's a list. Let me tell you, this is an amazing list. So, number five is Mason Williams, who has hit 283, 333, 429, 211 plate appearances for the Syracuse Mets. Number four, Wilfredo Tovar. Oh, my God. More walks and strikeouts. 292, 381, 403, and 357 plate appearances. Number three, Drew Jackson. A little surprised Drew Jackson hasn't been up at some point. 264, 412, 433 in 258 plate appearances. Number two, David Thompson. 238, 343, 508 in 210 plate appearances. But the number one player, if I give you, I bet if I give the triple slash line, Jared can get it. He's hit 253, 441, 444. It's Khalil. Lee. It is Khalil. Khalil Lee. Lee, yes. Yeah. Very distinctive. Yeah. 324. You mean he's been there since they sent him down? Foxy still can't hit. Probably not. 95 strikeouts in 200 and, uh, 324 plate appearances. It's a lot. It's not what you want. Jared has very strong feelings about hit tools now. We'll be covering that in our Twitch stream tomorrow night. But for now, we'll take a break come back with the second half of the show which is definitely i want to be clear before we start not the bad guys pop Yeah. 
Usually in the second half of the show, when one of us, usually me, is actually organized enough to find a guest, we have a guest. I decided to turn it on its ear for our 300th episode and make Jarrett and I the guests of this section of the podcast. So to that end, we need someone to interview us, I guess. So we found two familiar faces on the pod from over the years. It's Liam and Will. Fellas, what do you it's have for It's the us? Bad Guys Pod, It baby. is not the Bad Guys Pod, to be clear. <laughs> All right, so welcome, everybody. This is episode 33 of the Bad Guys Pod. I'm Will. I suppose I should have expected once again, this. All... <laughs> With me once again, as always, it's Liam. Liam, uh, well, the last time we recorded, uh, it was in the middle of the pandemic. It was 2020. Uh, all we, we could really must on. No, no, the last time we were on, we had uh, Ted Berg on because we couldn't really do a um, a Better Know a Bar segment. So we could basically just have Ted Berg on and just discuss uh, the musings of or compare Taco Bells in South Nassau County and Long Island. Uh, That was about the best we could do. And Yonkers, right, right, right. Yes, I remember. But um, yeah, no, so... uh, And and I should should also, I guess, at the front say that uh, the Bad Guys pod which will always spiritually be um, for all you alcoholics out there, which was the title of that show for the first three episodes before uh, we realized that our parents and I might actually figure out uh, that we have a podcast called uh, For All You Alcoholics Here. So so in the spirit of being the ultimate uh, yin to the yang that is this this show, um, you know, it only makes sense that we're hosting right now in this, this second half. Um, so, oh, so way, Jared, big yeah, thank yeah. you to uh, Craig Goldstein for allowing us to uh, host this podcast. Craig does not know anything about this. Oh, he knows everything. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Th- I wasn't going to tell him. Thank you, Cork, for all that you do. Yeah. Um, so, Jared, it says here you like you're a uh, you're a lawyer, or you, you you like law. What's your favorite law? What's my favorite law? Your favorite law. Uh, section 1983. You Is can that make all them Google the it. Violator album or <laughs> it's it's 42 US 1983. It's essentially the um it's under it's under how you can sue states for civil rights violations. And how can you sue states for civil rights violations under section 1983? <laughs> off the violator yeah it's 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 civil it's uh civil action for deprivation of uh rights by state actors is there such a thing as an uncivil action um yeah it's the ones that get thrown out of court really quickly jeffrey how are we doing uh i don't know what i expected to be honest what i <laughs> conceived of this segment <laughs> Well, well, section like 1983, section 1983 reminds me of section 1984, and um, all I could think about this morning was just how um, I just really wanted to listen to back to the time when David Lee, David Lee Roth hosted uh, the Howard Stern spot, um, and I was like kind of just like searching around this morning, and that's when I realized like I'm kind of like in the inverse of the pandemic at this point. Like now, it's like I, I'm past the point where i've i've searched everything in the last 12 months that i needed to search on the internet now it's like i don't know how to fill my time anymore um so it's it's like only is fitting that we're on the podcast that just like it does nothing but fill time in my day and really like in in my week and, and just really like give me the chance to like sit around and do listen to other people muse um and yet here we are and i i you know have Will, you... I got to tell you, that is a top 10 compliment right there. All this podcast does is fill time. Thank mm, you, yeah. Jeff. <laughs> it's the way I look at it. It only... 
look, like life's a journey. We're just basically on the ride, and this just is a nice way to fill time in between here and the end point of whatever that is. Well, you filled five um, minutes so I, far, and we've covered uh, absolutely one nothing. law. Yeah, one law. One law has been covered. <laughs> yeah. Probably I mean, not particularly Jared, well. Go talk to someone bird law, I'm down. But other than that. I was waiting for the bird law joke. Can it took about five minutes. We we got we got to get through all the, all the laws on this, so we got we got to kill some time. So we got to hit the hits, you know. Play the hits. My oh, actually, fun addict anecdote about my father. Apparently, uh, one night he went to see Jackson Brown, and uh, apparently Jackson Brown was ranting on about politics for twenty minutes, and my dad, being my dad, just stood up and say. Shut the fuck up and play the goddamn hits and stood back. <laughs> I saw I saw Jackson Brown at a fundraiser for John Kerry in two thousand four. Yep, sounds accurate. Yeah. yeah. So, th- those are his politics. Yeah. Yes. I guess yeah. I just accidentally revealed I was at a fundraiser for John Kerry in two thousand four. I was twenty at the time. So get canceled, sis. Yeah. <laughs> I when I was twenty. Helped elect Jim Kenny as mayor, so you know we all do stupid things in our twenties. Yes. Jeff, you were in a uh, New York uh, not too long ago. Um, I was I watching a Mets game. Yeah, I was an yeah, idiot. Yeah. yeah, and we I know you discussed a bit about the Mets game, but I mean, was it your first time back in the city since since everything? No, we had to. So my wife before the pandemic. Oh, wow started this uh yeah sick wife rag started this uh opera <laughs> program so she was going out of the city like once a week for uh like classes and networking and rehearsals and like writing time she was working with a bunch of uh, opera singers and you know uh, opera composers and stuff like that obviously the pandemic sent that all virtual but there's still doing a recording and concert of their opera scenes in the, in the coming month. So we had to go down for, I remember what she had to do. She had to go to some rehearsal in Brooklyn. So myself, Jess and the baby all went down to like, did a up and back run. Cause it was basically the easiest way to do it. All things considered. And I chilled with the baby at our, our friend's place in Queens. That's the only other time I've been How to the city. I feel to have a much cooler wife than you. Yeah, it's fine. Nice. I'm used to it at this I point. mean, we're all, to be fair, we're all uh, at least on track to have significant others that are fairly cooler than any of us. So, you know, it's it's what it is. I protest that. I, I object to that, but whatever. Jared is the least, like, connected for a wrestling person in his relationship now, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was just thinking, like, I think Kate would probably know more than I do at, about wrestling at this point. Uh, feel free to ask her that. Can we I get, think, can we get think... Kate on for the third half of the show after the Queen's uh, AEW show, Jarrett? Is that a thing you can make happen? She's not going to the Queen's AEW show. She is the Queen's AEW show. Yeah. So. In like the eighth half of the podcast, we should probably just do a trivia where it's just like me, Kate, and David Roth just go head to head in like trivia for like wrestling trivia. I think that's not that a would bad probably idea. Be... Yeah, so no. David would win. Is the... Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. he's he's edited so many of Bix's pieces that it's yeah. just like, and like Bix is just like one of those minds that just like bleeds wrestling info by osmosis. Yeah. I will never forget the day that oh, I God, I know where you're going Bix. with this. Because you know? <laughs> I was there. Uh, I, mean, I think we've already told <laughs> the, the big story on the podcast, David. probably with David. Yeah, I, well, I, I don't know if we have or not. But So, Liam and I went to a show that was basically, it was at the basketball court of a Planet Fitness in Queens. Mm-hmm. It, was, it wasn't It was even a Planet Fitness. It, it was like, like a knockoff Planet yeah. Fitness. It was... It was wild. Um, and the main event was Nick Gage versus Scott Steiner. Oh, my God. Wild. Which, yeah, which was just like... How do you I, not get... Yeah. yeah the match yeah. was terrible because Steiner wouldn't sell for him. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I recall it being like 900 million degrees. Also, yes. So, that right? as, so there's like, I don't know, they probably have like 250 people at this. Like, it wasn't a bad crowd for like a random New York indie show. And Liam had DM'd Bix, who was going, like, several times, like, hey, you want to meet up? Hey, you want to meet up? Hey, let's meet up. Let's have a drink. And so we get to the show. Totally intending on fucking with him and not actually meeting him for a drink. Yes. He gets, he, so we get to the show, and we sit down, and right next to me sits down a man in a 1999 WWF Y2J shirt. Who is David Bixon's fan, who I have met before. Um, so I have to pretend I don't know him, even though he like clearly recognizes me. And then he turns to Liam and says, Are you Jeans Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man. What, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who's Jeans Murphy? <laughs> and like he clearly knew it was actually Liam. I don't know how because like Liam doesn't have like pictures on his Twitter account and also doesn't even have his real name. Yeah. But he like clearly knew it was Liam. And he also like clearly knew he knew me. And then like just like we sat there awkwardly for most of the rest of the show. <laughs> I found it uh, hilarious. And like Bix is, like, genuinely weird to sit next to at wrestling shows because he, like, goes on, like, these monologues to himself, and it's, like, exactly what you would expect Bix to be like at a wrestling show. That sounds right, yeah. And, yeah, it was genuine. It was, it was, I would say it was actually uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> so that that's my, that's my Liam and David Bixon fan story. I have to go get my pizza real quick. I'll be right back. Oh, there we go. It's, it's the, the description of the bit turns into the actual bit. We're so. recording this on Friday night, just so people know. People will be able to figure it out, because I want to make a point here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. The Phillies are losing to the Rockies 11-1 at home, at their home, not the Rockies' home. They have used eight pitchers. Two, three, four, five. I just counted. I should know how many. Seven pitchers. Without looking at the box score. We should do this like going back and forth. So, Jarrett, you have to name one of the pitchers in the game. You'll go into it back and forth until you miss. I will tell you it was a bullpen game, so there was no starting pitcher. Jarrett. So we're talking about guys that the Rockies throw. No, the Phillies. Because they give the 11 Philly. runs in a bullpen okay. game against the Rockies. There we go. Okay. I, you know, I, you... Didn't I, I didn't think you'd be able to name, okay. like, uh, seven Rockies pitchers, in all honesty. Uh, so it's a bullpen game? It was a bullpen game. Um, oh, God. Phillies bull- Who's even in the Phillies bullpen that's, at this that's point? That's the question we're trying to answer right now, Jared. Uh, Jesus Christ. They put they put Suarez into the rotation. <laughs> um. Is Matt Moore in the Phillies bullpen? Matt Moore threw two innings and gave up one unearned run. Yes, he pitched in this game. He is in their bullpen. He pitched in this game. Will. Is Hector Neris in there? No Hector Neris. Will. Oh, geez. Um, I should also preface that um, I'm like the worst person to have on this podcast just for a baseball standpoint. Uh, I'm in like full on like grad school brain melting mode. So. Mm. Uh, I don't know if I could like name anybody that was even on the starting roster for the Phillies bullpen right now, um, but uh, uh, is... who fucking started this game? Is it? It was a bullpen, a bullpen game. game. Oh, it was a bullpen game. Oh, yeah. geez. Uh, you already said Matt Moore. Mm-hmm. Oh God. Uh, jeez, is it like just Ramon uh, Rosso is on it? Ramon Rosso in threw now? two innings and yeah. gave up two runs. Two oh, home right. runs, in fact. He gave up home runs to uh, CJ Crone and Trevor Story. Jarrett, back is to you. Is CJ Crone a real player? Yes. I just traded him in my they act- Tino Dynasty they- League for Jose Miranda. I know they just activated Sam Coonrod, so I'm going to say Sam Coonrod. Sam Coonrod started and threw one scoreless inning. 
Is De Los Santos in and that Gil game? Angel De Los Santos, through one and a third inning, gave up four runs, three walks, three strikeouts, one hit. Oh, there's the guy with the um, unfortunate name. I don't want to say it. Sam Coonrod. Yeah. Is he already, already named. Oh. Um, You've gotten three of the, the seven. Pedrosian? Yep, Cam Pedrosian through one and two-thirds scoreless innings. Cam Pedrosian is a Philly. I think I knew that. We've who's, got three more to go. Three more. It doesn't really matter. There, like the guy with the last name Hammer. J.D. Hammer, like yes, he threw two-thirds of an inning, gave up a run, uh, gave up a home run, in fact, to Elias Diaz. I think I looked when I looked. Yeah, Elias Diaz. <sighs> are they still He's... actually? Are they still actually pitching Archie Bradley? Yeah, Archie Bradley, I don't know, but he did not pitch in this game. Okay. Are they still but, actually uh, pitching Jose Alvarado? Uh, I don't know, but he didn't pitch in this game. There's one more okay. to get. Ian Kennedy? Is it's he... Bailey Falter. It is Bailey Falter, who gave up three runs in a third of an inning. Yeah. These motherfuckers out here generating, uh, doing creative players in uh, in September. Down. How many, back, how many games are they back right now? Was it three two? And a half, three and a half. Yeah. They're about to be four and a half, because the Braves are winning. There's like severe, serious um, NFC East energy from the NL East this year. It's just like, it's this like weird thing where it's like, if none of us try to really get over the hump uh, down the stretch, it's like, we're all kind of like, it's like this, um, it, it's like collusion if like, everybody just decided that like all your buds were going to like hang out on a, on a Friday night. And then like, none of you guys decided to go out because like, you're all just really content staying in. It's like that level of collusion where it's just like, uh, between these teams, it's just like, this is like really boring. Like, uh, this is just boring baseball, man. Yeah. I don't yeah. yeah. I mean, I haven't really watched many games this year at all, but that's also because of working 70 hours a week. For like six months, so I kind I feel like I came out on top here. You know, I was really pissed off that I couldn't watch a lot of the mess this year, and um, no, it seems like the long term just don't even watch scenario was the best idea. Yeah, but you know that I I'm excited to see in season six of Billions when. Uh, <laughs> Bobby Axelrod <laughs> buys the Mets to spite the other billionaire he's competing against. They have to work that into the storyline, right? Yeah. I, Do you think they, they can cross it over with uh, Ted Lasso and he, he buys the the, uh, the team? That'd be good. No spoilers. I still haven't watched this week's episode. No, I, haven't, I haven't even started season two yet. But that's good. It's pretty good. I haven't even seen it. And I know that you two have a an all out preview. Review, review. at this point. Uh, re- re- review. I can speak English, I think. So I won't even go into wrestling too much. But I am wondering what are you guys looking forward to this year? In in general? Just like... in general. In your lives. You know, you got anything special planned? I like how you kind of went into a Larry King voice when you did that. <laughs> I am. I am Shitty Wolf Blitzer, not Shitty Larry King. I mean, it's like kind no, of I'm, hard I'm to actually plan ahead at this yeah, point. Yeah, I don't know what next right. yeah, the next year yeah. is going to be like. Right. I like, I'm going to be writing like prospect lists for four months, and then uh, other stuff's going to happen, I guess. Yeah, like I've had yeah. to dump tickets to multiple baseball games, or not baseball, wrestling shows, also baseball games, but, yeah. Did yeah. you get your ticket to Brady? What's that? No, I did not. Oh, um, okay. He, uh, I think he bought it from a friend in, like, the Wrestling Observer verse. <laughs> the, uh, the one verse? Yeah, which is a weird thing. Yeah, <laughs> Brady's like... Brady, like, knows, like, all the Wrestling Observer people now, which is, like, wild. Uh, I know some of them, too, but, uh, yeah. Um, So I think he got the ticket from there. I think one of the guys there hooked him up. No, I sold mine on StubHub. Good for Um, you. Yeah, I just, I 
I mean, I'm not going to the Newark show this week either. I just, I was hoping there was a mask or a vaccine. If there was a mask or a vaccine mandate, I would have went. But I just, I don't feel comfortable without that. And New Jersey has still not implemented any of that stuff. New York has, so I'm still going to go to the Queens show. It's outdoors, too. Outdoors, I guess, too. Yeah. 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 No, no, I mean, they're not, they haven't said whether they're keeping the um, roof closed or not. But. I will perpetually find it wild that I am I am still not considered an, an essential worker despite constantly having to go to work with where there's essentially no vaccine, uh, no mask mandate. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, you know, I, I don't think the policy on this stuff has been very good, and that's certainly across political aisles, and you've got patchwork state by state city by city stuff like there's no you know the new jersey and new york state governments were coordinating everything very closely <laughs> for a very long time and, right up and until, then what happened <laughs> right up until the governor of new york resigned and the governor of new jersey had to run for election and doesn't want to do any unpopular stuff two months before his election and so uh, so on a scale of one to ten how much does phil murphy look like michael keaton like seven i would go like a full nine on that one he's got the weird smile that he that michael yeah. has too yeah you know who else has it is don Callis. yes mm. i saw that mm. the other yeah, day I I was like, yeah. Mm. yeah 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 imagine those three in a room though i feel like michael keaton is a guy that lots of people look like yeah as far as like famous people go there but yeah i mean i have no idea like you know there's certainly trips i'd like to take um you know there's people that are supposed to come visit us at various points that just you know can't get in the country or can't travel or whatnot so i mean as i sit here drinking a fifth hammer beer this would have been a pretty good episode to have done and recorded in uh Long Island City Brewery, yet and still we, you know, yeah. Happy I mean, anniversary. We, we didn't do it for. I guess you guys didn't do it for reasons that are pretty obvious. We talked about doing this. I mean, Jeffrey talked about coming down here. Um, we talked about doing something in conjunction with um, Allison and Maggie and Linda's podcast is doing a live episode in a couple of weeks. Uh, I talked to Allison about that. I just, I, and this is mostly me at this point. Um, I just, I didn't really feel comfortable doing any kind of like live event type stuff. You know, I'm obviously we've both been vaccinated for a while now, but you know, it's still kind of, you know, I haven't been vaccinated 14 month year old, 14 month year old. That's the thing. You know, I have. I have medical conditions that yeah. are not a secret to anybody that's listening to this. And yeah. I mean, we, we like me and Will have an uncle that like we literally cannot see out in public because he has uh, myeloma, which completely, de- you know, decreases your immune system. He got he got vaccinated, didn't even hold because his immune system is essentially gone. Yeah. So and now. That- there's just people we haven't seen for yeah. fucking months, year. Yeah, and I mean, I've seen Jeffrey. I went up to Jeffrey's house a couple of months ago, but... Oh, sick, sick hanging out with Jeffrey Bragg, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. For did, you guys, did you guys go to Stu Leonard's together? No, we went to a... No, I went to a one-year-old's birthday party, which was not at Stu Leonard's. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But, it's not even a Stu Leonard's that close, in all honesty. Yeah. You're more a total wine guy, anyway. Or... But I am yeah, a total I mean, wine I just, guy. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't feel comfortable sitting in indoors with like tons of unmasked people at this point. I, you know, I'm not really doing indoor dining right now. Don't. Yeah. Don't. Don't really feel like doing indoor arena events where there's no masking or vaccine i assume this stuff is going to shake itself out over the next couple of months it does 
look like things have stopped getting substantially worse, and it does seem like vaccine mandates are becoming more prevalent, both of which are, you know, I think positives, but that's yeah. just that's I, a, it's a crazy and in many ways shitty world right now. It's, uh, right. I, I don't actually like have like stuff i'm definitely looking forward to i'm I'm looking forward to my fire table arriving and being able to which kind you get i know you were looking for yeah i got a propane one with you know very hank hill of you listen dude you guys all know me you guys have all hung out with me do you really see me like chopping up wood or charcoal or some shit and throw it into the a charcoal fight. just comes like, in briquettes man you just like pour yeah. it I just want to hit a fucking button and watch the fire come <laughs> up loser the dreams of Prometheus wood. Fire, fire machine go burr yeah yeah. Uh, Jared, there's literally a thing that you can get that literally chops your logs for you we in fact have a large pile of logs that we inherited but yes yeah. uh, are you just ca- going to walk people around your property and say, behold, my large pile of logs and keep walking? <laughs> no, it's just kind of the back. Oh, we have a like, wood-burning fire pit back there, too. It's like built into the ground, but I don't know if we're ever actually going to use it. Inadvisable. They cause the most amount of uh, house fires. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but... Kind of- Jeff, I was kind of leading, I was, and this kind of applies to you too, Jared, I was kind of leading into the, before, I was like asking you about last time you were in the city, and it's just like, you know, kind of like in the spirit of us being on, I kind of want to like do the whole bad guys thing, or just like ask you about bars you've been to in, in the tri-state city area, and just riff on that, but it's like, kind of, I don't know, it's, it's still weird, it's just like kind of a weird side of the end of this year, where like, talking about doing the things and going out and really experiencing um i don't know being out on the town it's kind of like a weird hodgepodge it's like i can't you know like this time last year i think there was at least like a celebration of the places that were still open and and the you know even for you know if you were not staying in all the time and like you could kind of just kind of chance your chance it and sit outside and, and at least embrace the outdoor seating part of it and, and trying to keep things alive or do take out and it's like now it's just like you know <laughs> there's no there's no rules nothing really matters and like if if uh if somebody's uh something's going out going on that's like worth supporting like god bless but otherwise it's like nothing really makes sense nobody really knows what's going on with this stuff and I, I you know it's like kind of odd for me to like sit and like oh yeah uh better know a bar it's like well for who you know who's who should be going out to do this stuff eat arby's yeah eat arby's that's a good that's a good the nice thing is we do have a lot of breweries with like outdoor seating at least in the area now yeah. right you have it you have a baby so like the brewery is like gonna be your your safe yeah, haven for the less. next for the next five or six years of your life so, so we took the baby to her first concert cause there was an outdoor concert in the park with a chamber orchestra that jess has worked with a lot over the years so she got to hear some philip glass string quartets well a philip glass string quartet yeah she she I, hasn't uh she hasn't picked up on the nuances of 433 yet m- mainly because she's a she's a baby and mm-hmm. noise is you know what she does so I mean, I'd like to go to like an actual concert. There's multiple mountain goat shows in my area. Uh, Lucy Dacus and uh, Julian Baker are both coming through as well, fairly close. And it's just like, yeah, I'm not going to be doing these. Jeffrey, how long have I been bothering you for? Is it? We've is it established. Nine? We've established this at some point. I think it was 2013. Oh my god! That's the first email you sent into the podcast. It was about trading Kevin Ploiecki and Raphael Montero for Didi Gregorius. Oh yeah! Wow, that is a 2013 email if ever I've heard one. Jesus yeah. Christ! Is Didi really like? Is he like future former future 
Met. Yes. Yeah, he's he's kind oh, of cool definitely. Yeah. Met. Nah. Orlando Hudson, I think, was like maybe my favorite former future Met. I just like I I, I don't want to reference um, blogs that were really big on the during the early tens, but uh, certainly like I remember just hitting refreshes on on certain Mets um, publications that really just like pumped up guys like. Uh, um, uh, Joe Blanton, uh, Orlando Hudson. I'm Orlando to... Hudson's the one I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I only get, in the early 2010s, I only got all my Mets news from our fearless thought leader, who I will not name, but I think Jarrett knows exactly who the fuck I'm referencing. 2014, I found the email. Ah. Uh. You want, sorry, you wanted to trade uh, Rafael Montero and Wilmer Becerra for something. Yeah. God, whatever happened to Wilmer Becerra? He just flamed out, right? He torched his shoulder, and the Mets had him play with a torched shoulder for a while, and then they fixed his shoulder finally, and he couldn't hit after that. Well, that'll happen. Oh, God. It happened a lot to them in that era with prospects that had never lifted weights before going to a certain weightlifting place. Well, you know. Wilmer Becerra mm-hmm. last appeared, at least according to Baseball Reference, in the 2019-2020 Venezuelan Winter League uh, with the uh, the uh, Navigantes del Mahalenas and hit 325, 393, 413. So I assume he will continue to play Venezuelan Winter Ball as... Oh, Time I meant on. to ask. He's um, only 26. Oh, all right. Uh, did did you guys see, like, the boxing news for this weekend? I mean, yes. Mm, nah. Like, I mean, the boxing, boxing... We're putting boxing in quotes here, I suppose. But the commentating? Yeah, no, I know what you were nah. referring to, Liam. My buddy just said, what the fuck? Yeah, I mean mm. that's 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 a grift and yeah, it's grifters, grifters are gonna grift. I cannot wait until twenty twenty four to have Joe Biden mindlessly ramble on during like what would be the best thing for Joe Biden to commentate? I mean, it's gonna on? be like the FCS finals with like Delaware in it, probably. That would that would be top tier. Hmm. Him just referencing all the random shit in Delaware. All right. I feel like this this is good for you guys. You don't want us. You you don't want me and Will staying here for too long. I said I wanted a half <laughs> hour. It's been thirty three minutes. So yeah. Uh, I I guess uh, you know I, I've. Um... Do you have a wrap up question? That's fine. Uh, do you have a good uh, off the record story that um, that you're willing to share with us? It doesn't have to be Jordani Valdespin, uh, but like if you just want to give us another like Jordani Valdespin uh, yeah. nugget. So, yeah. we, so the thing is, if we talk about it on the podcast, it becomes no on the record. record. Yeah. yeah, that's the whole point of why don't you just change the, the names of all the the people involved? You know, do it like a like a crime story. You know. The assassination uh, of Ryan Murphy presents the assassination, uh, true crime, the assassination of Jordani Valdespin. I mean, they'll let Ryan Murphy just about any show he wants at this point, so. Does does he control half of network TV? Yeah, probably something like yeah. that. I don't really watch network TV or any TV, so. I, I will, th- this will go back for, like, real old heads of the podcast. Um, this isn't off the record, but it's kind of funny. Um, long-time listeners may remember a Mets prospect named Stefan Sable, mm-hmm. uh, um, who I thought was interesting and ended up basically literally being the guy that cut for Tim Tebow. Um, and... Stefan Sable, it turns out, has a brother 
who is a catching yes. prospect yes. in the pirate system named Blake Sable. I was going to mention who, that to you since you're seeing Greensboro, yeah. Without knowing that he was Stephen Sable's brother, I thought was pretty interesting this week. <laughs> Uh, you know, nice loose swing. He's got some, you know, all fields power. I don't know if he can catch or not, but you know, that's well, kind Steve, of an interesting. Uh, Stable, Stephen Sable was a catcher in JUCO before he had he had thoracic outlet syndrome, yes. I think, and couldn't throw after that. Yes. Why do I remember these things? Like I have to think how many years I've been married. I'm actually not sure, but I can remember that Stephen Sable was a catcher in like some Oregon JUCO before. Yes, he had thoracic outlet um, syndrome. So the kicker to the whole thing is he has is the, the sable brothers there's another sable brother who's like a 2023 prep whose name is jared j-a-r-e-t-t oh yes it's right. the him. same way no it's um, one R R R two, but it's, in the, it's oh. in the same it's in the same uh same grouping yeah. and of course all of these brothers are cousins of NFL Hall of Fame safety, Troy Palomalu. Yep. Because that is the Stephen Sable claim to fame, is he is Troy Palomalu's cousin. Mm. But Blake Sable, I had no idea. It's a fairly common last name, so I had sure, no sure. idea that he was actually related. Like, it just didn't occur to me to look that up. But he is indeed Stephen's brother, which Dave Hansen pointed out on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, so that's my, that's my Greensboro wrap-up. Uh, so what you're telling me is Tim Tebow and Troy Palomalu are hated enemies. And that Tim Tebow will play for the Pittsburgh Pirates next year. That's not really a uh, off-the-record version. But, yeah. actually a Cal- I forgot. He went to the University of Oregon and then transferred to a California JUCO, Orange Coast College in a Costa Mesa. Yes. So... That is my story to wrap things up. This has been the Bad Guys Pod. We're going to well, turn it over to you, Jeffrey and Jarrett. Yeah, I uh, I will first just end on the note of, uh, for me personally, saying, uh, A, I'm sorry that we basically uh, just grew, ruined uh, the second half of your podcast, <laughs> but that's kind of like been the dream, so I, I yeah. appreciate the opportunity. And secondly, too, and this is just like an off-topic, I know... It's 300 episodes, and, and it's obviously uh, this this podcast has taken a lot of forms. But I'll, this is me doing the the uh, verbal version of Liam's earnest uh, email that he does every now and then at the end of the year. But uh, I, you know, I'm like at this point now, it's like your guys are three, 300 episodes in. I've been listening probably since I think it was it 2016, the wild card game. That's pretty much when I started listening to you guys regularly. And I gotta say, like I from that point on is when I started really like changing uh career paths and i'm now most of the way through a graduate program where i'm i'm looking at like and you know improving workplaces and and um you know learning about things like um how to create selection processes and and equity and and all of that I, like i kind of had this realization today before it i didn't really have anything prepared to like uh segment wise in the podcast but i will say like I and mean, you kept it you kept it true to life so yeah, but I will say it's like the you know it's I, I think about like the 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 way I've the direction I've gone in my life and it's very much influenced by a lot of the banter, especially Jared and like a lot of the you know uh, criticisms that come through this podcast. But I think a lot of you know because we are all both all just generally lizard brain sports fans uh, at at our core and, and kind of process the world sometimes through through these you know the the machinations of this sports stuff that happens it doesn't really mean anything but but uh, i really appreciate the criticism and and and, and not so that not obviously like this not so much the cynicism and i know that the stuff that just pisses off people on twitter but really just like the earnesty and the insight and uh the perspective and the the, the boldness to um has all probably influenced me in a very positive way so in in an earnest way i congratulate you both on 300 episodes and, and thank you for for giving me something to think about and helping me see the world uh that's usually shown through me at wfan but in a different way so thank you guys thank you way to ruin it with like total earnestness well yeah well, i know don't worry jeffrey what, 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 what i've gotten yeah, more right, right, yeah. nine years 
All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll do the third half of the show. I get up in the evening And I ain't got nothing to say I come home in the morning I go to bed feeling the same way I ain't nothing but tired Yeah, I'm just tired and bored with myself Hey the baby I could use just a little help You can't start a fire You can't start a fire without a spark This gun's for higher Even if we're just dancing in the dark Welcome back. Now it's time for the third half of the show. Before we do the third half of the show, we do housekeeping. This is episode 300 for all you kids out there. What a long, strange trip it's been. For all you kids out there, it's a message agent to Baseball Prospectus podcast. You can find us on the internet at baseballprospectus.com. The podcast is on iTunes and various other non-iOS apps. Just search for For All You Kids Out There and you listen or subscribe right there. I encourage you to do both. I also encourage you to rate and review the podcast. If you want to get in contact with the show... We're on Twitter at For All You Kids. Jarrett's on Twitter at J.A. Seidler. I'm on Twitter at Jeff Paternostro. Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash For All You Kids out there. And you can email the show at all you kids at baseballperspectus.com. We are rejoined by Allison McCaig. Uh, you don't know this. We're actually joined by Allison McCaig, so we're doing the correspondence now. This has been <laughs> wildly out of order, but it'll all make sense. You can just Even probably bet whenever we're recording, the Mets have had a bad loss the day before. It's yeah. usually a safe yeah. bet. Uh, our first question from the Facebook group is from Kyle. Q for the P. What do you think about Cole Gordon, Double A Northeast League Pitcher of the Month for August? Are you ready, Jarrett? I know this is your f- the thing you like the most on this show. I, is when we I talk believe he's a three. I, he's probably not even a three. Is the thing? It's a uh, two. He, he might be a three as a reliever, but they have him stretched out as a starter. Like I got decent reports on him post. I guess it would have been post twenty nineteen draft. Yeah. Um, I did see him. It was one of the starts when Binghamton was in Hartford. Uh, what, like a month ago now when Jerry complained about all the other threes I talked about. 
Uh, I mean, <sighs> the reason he was the AA Northeast Pitcher of the Month is he's got, like, probably an average curveball that he commands well. It's like a good 11-6 to 6 shape. You throw that a lot. It's like kind of a deceptive delivery. It gets downhill well. But it's like 88 to 90 with the fastball and the command's not amazing. So, not you know, exactly does that low 90s and short burst with the usable curveball? Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Sure. Again, this is like to talk about or to re reiterate the point I made. I think we did this the first time. This is a perfect.